Yeah, I wanted to get some information on this guitar first of all. Uh, that guitar is an American Standard Stratocaster uh, with a special color made in the custom shop from Fender, and it has the Eric Clapton electronics in it. They don't make that guitar with the, with that color or with that electronics, so the custom shop made it for me. Uh, and it's a, a new guitar, but it's, it happens to be a, a very nice new guitar. And it's one that I play a whole lot, record a whole lot with. Uh, I think the Eric Clapton electronics with the mid-range control really makes a big difference in, for me to be able to play it on stage and sometimes have it sound like a Stratocaster and then other times have it sound more like a Gibson or you know, a fatter humbucker kind of sound. Lace sensor. Lace sensor, yes. Uh, it has Spurzel tuners that lock from the bottom, and it has uh, one of those nuts that it goes, it's like a roller system. You know, it has a, a little pin, the strings roll across it, like that. Hello there. Hi, Warren. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? Oh, crazy. <laughs> yeah? So nothing's changed? Hi. How you doing? Hi, Steve Harrison. Hi, Steve. Hello. Hi, Mr. This is Steve, the Magger, young guitarist. All right. It's a gun type. <laughs> yeah, I remember you guys from last year. Yeah, it was just one year ago. It's almost exactly mm -hmm. the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, I guess we talked to you guys the day before the show, and you saw the show the following day, mm -hmm. and uh, he was quite impressed. Uh, it was a great, great show. Well, thank you. You uh, played about two and a half hours, but he heard you guys had even wanted to play longer than that. Yeah, yeah a lot of times we're faced with a curfew situation where yeah. we have to stop at a certain time, and we'd like to keep going. Sometimes, uh, you know, when, when we're allowed to, we'll play three, three and a half hours. Yeah, right. I think one of the things here is uh, we've been told, anyway, that the train systems stop at a certain time. If we don't quit playing, then everybody's stranded, you know, without a ride, and, and so that's what we're... Yeah, the inside, I'm not going to... So the people, uh, you know, he saw it, were so impressed that uh, when they were finishing the show, they were... Uh, Completely fatigued because they got into so much. <laughs> yeah. Us too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mutual thing. So then, at that time, three shows were done. So, 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 and the third thing was just the, 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 the power of the unit as a whole. It was three things really stood out uh, when you saw the show. Mm. Mm, comment? I mean, I don't know what to comment. Yeah. But, but Domo. <laughs> 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 That's the, the thing is, you know, for the unit to work well together is the most important thing, I think, for all of us, you know. It, uh, most of the time we're able to do that, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to get up there night after night and, and put that much into it, you know, it's not like we're just up there uh, playing the licks off the record, you know, we're up there trying to give 110% every night, and, you know, so that's the, if, if we pull that off, definitely we hope people notice it. <laughs> He heard that your Les Paul has had the Duncans, Duncan pickups added to mm -hmm. it. You changed Duncans, I guess. Seymour Duncans, uh, yeah, they're the the standard, I think they call them. Mm -hmm. Just the, the, they're a copy of the Les Paul pickup. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't change because I wanted to change from the old Gibson pickups to that. I changed because the old Gibson pickups went bad. In what way? They were just so old. Uh -huh. They were 30 years old, and they, they quit working. They got One quit working altogether. The other one got real weak. So, um, uh, you know, I just tr thought, I, I well, I had to change. I, it happened on the road, the one went out. So I had to do something quick, and I happened to be in New York, so I just went to Seymour Duncan and asked him, and they have, uh, I'd like to try their standard. 
Les Paul pickup. You know, it's a copy of the Les Paul. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried them, and they were so good, I just didn't bother to change them. They sound, they sound really good. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's the, uh, this is back to the tone, too, now that you're bringing this up again, but I think, really, I've done a lot of experimenting. I, you know, I've been playing a long time. I've done a lot of experimenting with new guitars and old pickups and old guitars and new pickups and, you know, and all these different things. Uh, you can put old pickups in a green piece of wood, a new guitar, and it don't sound good, you know. Uh, you can put new pickups in an old guitar like this and it doesn't seem to change the tone. So, you know, over a lot of those kind of things happening over the years, I, I, I'm convinced that it's the wood and the neck wood being aged and being aged even before the guitar was built, for one thing. They used to age it and they ran out of aged wood back in 59. I see. That's why those old guitars sound especially good. Huh. And the uh, uh, other thing is even now that it's built, it's aged another 30 years or so. It's good and dry and resonant. And, and when I buy a guitar like this, I don't even bother to plug it in an amp. I bought one just the other day, a 1954 Les Paul. Hmm. And the guy says, here, plug it in an amp. I said, no, I'll go in the bathroom. So you go in the bathroom and just... Listen, I had three to choose from. And I'd play them. He said, God, you know, I said, no, I, I want to hear how the wood sounds. I never listened to it to an amp. I just bought right? I said, I'll take this one. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, so that's my feeling about it. I've talked to Gibson about it a few times, and I don't know if uh, they said that, you know, it's so hard to get aged wood, they can't build them. And I, I suggested that they do a special edition signature model and, and charge more money for it. You know. Could and they have access to the materials to build that kind of They could get enough aged wood to build a select few, you know, <laughs> and just call them signature models, you know, have somebody sign the name on it and, and try, help charge a lot of money for it. I know a lot of people would pay it. I'd probably buy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on those well, yeah, you happen to be. Well, you Seymour Duncan is highly respected. They got a great reputation for building a, a, a Gibson pickup, and and they don't they don't build it and claim it to be their own. They openly say this is a copy of the old Gibson pickups. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. uh, so it wasn't that I just haphazardly oh, I grabbed some. I, I knew where to go to get the best thing, but I didn't have time to look for old vintage pickups. Mm -hmm. Is the point right. I was trying to make. So right. I, I just went and got the Seymours, hoping they would work. They sound as good as any pickup I've ever heard, and, and so I just left them in there. But Duncan, we're playing on the slide one. You, like the the, uh, the pick. When you, <laughs> you were picking when you played the slide one. Uh, I usually keep the pick like like this. Up. If I'm playing with my fingers, then I just like cup the pick in my hand. Mm -hmm. Ninety percent of the slide stuff I play with my fingers. Yeah. The only time I use the actual pick is like Elmore James type mm -hmm. stuff, you know. Uh, and then some of the actual just lead guitar stuff that I'm playing is with my fingers as well. It's just a different tone. You get that meat on the string, kind of like Albert King got. You know, it's a warmer, fatter sound, but it also has the attack. Right. You know, it's it's a different sound. But on slide, it really works well. Plus, you can use the other fingers that you're not picking the string with to deaden the strings that you don't want to ring. So uh, I think most slide players that um, try and, you know, uh, take slide play into a different place play that way. Most of the really good slide players that I know of play with their fingers, at least to some extent. I see. I see. Slide, does it also have something to do with the fact that you keep your the regular tuning of the guitar? Uh, does what? That you play with, that you pick the uh, with the fingers? Yeah. No, I think uh, even when I play uh, open tunings, which I don't do much on stage, I still play with my fingers, you know. And like uh, Dwayne Allman played uh, with his fingers in open tuning. Ry Cooter plays mostly with his fingers in open tuning. Most people do. I think the main thing that I accomplish from playing in a standard tuning is that I'm able to play a little differently 
than than the norm because uh, I can play some licks that you, would be real hard to play in standard tuning. That and also that if we want to play uh, a song where I can play a slide solo in the middle but play chords and we can play a twin harmony part in the middle, that I can play lead guitar and slide guitar on the same guitar. That's the main reason I play it like that is it just opens up that variation yeah, for me. Yeah, you kind of learn to that point too. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Uh, I didn't really know any better. <laughs> it's it's, time, it's you know? harder playing slide in standard Spanish tuning is much harder to do. I don't mm -hmm. know how he does. Yeah. I can't do it. It's it's oh. really uh, hard, but it's it, it opens up some new doors. You it's know? Uh, Dwayne switched back and forth like that. Also, you may not realize. Not that we're talking about Dwayne, but we're talking about slide guitars, and I don't know how you can talk about slide guitars without having some anecdotes about Dwayne. But he uh, he played Dreams and. Dreams was straight standard tuning, uh, and uh, but uh, you know I I don't play a lot of electric slide now, uh, or I don't play none now that he's here. But I play all the acoustic slide. But uh, still, one reason you don't want to use the picks is you've got you know you've got this on the strings, so you're not touching the strings with this hand, and if you have plastic here on this hand. You know, you're not touching it. <laughs> anyway, see, yeah. You know, you're just kind of, its it can be real cold, and it's hard to get any warmth to it. So when you you got the glass here, if you can get the meat, you know, on there, you can put a little bit of feeling and warmth to it. Uh, that's, you know, it's, it's just a feel kind of thing, too. And uh, when I'm playing acoustic slide, like uh, in the acoustic set, I use a thumb pick and a, and a finger pick to make the acoustic hit, you know, hard, but I leave the pick off of this finger so that I can reach in and, and keep, you know, get some kind of uh, human <laughs> sound in contact with the guitar. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, the flesh really has a great tone. Yeah, if, if I use all finger picks, it sounds like a bunch of cats fighting, you know, and it just, <laughs> just too, it's too hard, uh, no soul to it. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I, I set my tone usually to play... Um, with a pick, so to speak, when I switch to my fingers and play, I play for a while, and then I switch back to the pick. I go, God, that just doesn't sound good, you know. The the playing with the fingers is just the, the tone. Mm -hmm. The last come on into my kitchen. You mm -hmm. do come on into my kitchen on the, the last album, I guess, which is mm -hmm. the last cut of the record, right? Robert Johnson song. Why did you pick that particular to to close the album? To close it, I guess it just seems like a closing piece, you know. Uh, we picked it, originally we worked it up to play on the MTV Unplugged mm. show that we did in America. And it just um, seemed to really feel good with the band playing it. That's why we continued playing it and it eventually led to us recording it. Mm. We've been playing a, a lot of that Robert Johnson stuff for a long, long time. We just never have done acoustic things on stage, or in public for that matter, very little. Maybe a TV show here or there. But uh, It's kind of scary. But Yeah, and, and the technical end of it is, is so overwhelming that it's a, big, it's a big battle to get past the technical problems with playing acoustically unless that's all you're doing but to go from electric to acoustic and back it can really be a nightmare sometimes but anyway um, we played those Robert Johnson things like sitting around having fun like at cookout in the yards or jam sessions just personal kind of things for years you know. uh, Come in My Kitchen is one that we selected to put on the album one thing it may be one that people are familiar with, you know, and uh, and we have kind of an arrangement of it that nobody has done. There's another thing. And uh, to close the album, I don't know. It seems like when you close an album program, you close it just the opposite as you do a show. When you're doing a show, you try to close it real strong. Doing an album, you want to get strong in the middle and then kind of come back down again. I don't know why, but yeah. that's just the concept that we've always had, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of leave it with a soothing touch at the end. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Little Martha probably was the last song. I, I just guess, but you know that. One. It's a nice peaceful release mm-hmm. yeah. for the end of the record. Hmm. Hmm. Good. Do you think that you'll uh, be committing more acoustic numbers to uh, the CD there? Now that you, you know, since you he 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 saw the uh, broadcast of your show. It was shown on satellite TV here, or taped here in town. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, he said it really worked well. It sounded good on the CD as well. Do you think you're going to do more uh, stuff like that in the studio in the future, acoustic stuff like that? Well, we're doing a live album right now. We're halfway through it. We've already got part of it recorded. We recorded in Macon, Georgia. And I, we, we really could put the whole thing out right now, but we would like to record in Boston and New York and some other places to put in with it. But that is just what we played here in... Uh, Basically, what we played in Tokyo the other night. I don't know if y'all saw if you saw that show. Okay, well, we added about five songs to that, and that's that's basically what we're going to record for the next album, a live album. And that all, all that acoustic set will be in it. No, I see. Yeah. Well, when you say acoustic set, what, what do you refer to? And we do about five acoustic songs. Oh, is it right? Oh yeah, I yeah. thought I was thinking you'd you know. Yeah. Those, I, the, I did an interview a while ago and they had already seen the show so oh, I, I was assuming that you oh, had too um, yeah we do a whole acoustic section now in the in the set like five songs it's a real nice surprise for everybody because nobody's ever seen us do it before even in America we have I guess you guys are kind of faded to that you know, live album you know, sort of the, what the, the, the public expect you know yeah, not too many people are doing live albums now, and uh, and we've always been uh, considered uh, uh, our strongest point was always our live performances, mm-hmm. much stronger than our uh, than our recordings. Yeah. So uh, I think Film Noir East pretty much set the standard for live albums, you know, through the seventies. Well, it was a hell of a live album, yeah. yeah and uh, so we're we're trying to. Uh, well, of course, we're trying to do better than that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't want to just do as good as that. I mean, it, we were all playing better than we did back then, and uh, so. Uh, mm. Yeah, no, it's an album. Then. Point on latest release, uh, Shades of Two Worlds. Um, he says it sounds a lot more like the real Almond Brothers than the one before that did, in terms of the performances in terms of the songs themselves. Is that an, an accurate uh, appraisal of the record? Mm-hmm. We felt like, uh, well, the band had grown. We'd been playing together longer. You know, uh, we had a whole nother year on stage, which is, you know, let's face it, that's where we rehearse, is on the stage. We can rehearse three weeks before the tour, but we learn more in the first five nights of the tour than we do in the whole rehearsal because that's where the really intense rehearsal comes is on stage. We had this whole other year of playing together and it, it made a lot of difference and uh, we uh, the the absence of the piano where there was more emphasis on Greg's organ which made it sound more like the original Alden Brothers and uh, there was a little more focus on uh, tr- really trying to take it back to that early sound and plus uh, the whole approach of recording it was a much more live approach. We we really did both records basically live, but on Shades of Two Worlds, we uh, we set up everybody in the studio all at once, and uh, very few overdubs, especially on the guitar solos and stuff like that. You know, there are always certain things you're going to have to overdub because of the technical problems. You know, usually you have to do the the vocals and stuff again, but. Uh, most of the guitar solos that we played were live on the track and we had a lot more uh, room for jamming so to speak and we actually were able to incorporate a lot of the the jams that uh, we would get into on stage and work them into the new material for the records you know because we get out there and play differently every night and these jams kind of materialize that uh, we need to try and incorporate into the actual uh, record so to speak you guys uh, said last time that you were you referred to yourselves as a progressive uh, unit, a progressive band. Uh, I, he, 
uh, assumes that you were referring to the way you, the band grows when, when you when you call yourself progressive, that you continue to evol- evolve, I guess. Musically, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, that was in response to the Southern rock mm-hmm. cliche. Uh, southern rock really doesn't describe what the Allman Brothers are all yeah. about. You know, you know, Southern rock was a good, a good usable. Uh, necessary term back in the 70s when there were like 10 groups that were could be categorized in, in that in that kind of thing but it's been so long now and we're really about the only band that sounds like that and we've always been the only band that sounds like us but there's not a whole group of bands and, and, and it, it you know, you don't call the Grateful Dead a Western band, or you don't call a band from New York a, a Northern band. And we hate, we are continuously trying to get away from that Southern band. Yeah. Because it, it connotates, it has a connotation to it that it's like we're supposed to play a certain kind of way. Right. You know? And we don't want to supposed to play a certain kind of way. For yeah. We want to play, you know, what 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 we play. And, um, and we've, you know, we were going to tour with uh, Black Crows. We're all friends with Black Crows. They're from Atlanta, and we like their band. They like our band. They would, they didn't want to, they couldn't tour with us because they were afraid they would get tagged with that Southern rock thing. Is that right? Yes, yeah, I mean it's, it's no good. You know, what I mean, it's, it's, it's also unfortunately the whole Southern rock. Thing uh, seems to portray in some people's minds uh, a nostalgia trip. Like, yeah. oh, is, is Southern rock coming back? Is it, you know, uh, the blues and the jazz and the rock influences that this band has have never left. They're always there. You know, it's just that for a while, uh, some disco, yeah, you know, some more techno-oriented sounds seem to be more risen to the surface, so to speak. But uh, blues and jazz will never die. You know, they're always going to be there. And, and Southern rock really seemed to be a dated concept. People expected uh, the whole shit kicker image and, you know, for us to get out there and, I don't know, it's just a. Drink whiskey and. Raise hell. Boys, you know, you know and, uh, it's, it's just, it's not what we ever were about anyway. You know, we've, we've always been just a, as serious about making as much music and, and, uh, and having a, a good time, you know, uh, as anybody does. We never were into that redneck kind of thing at all. He thinks that in Japan, um, you actually stand to benefit from the Southern Rock uh, label. Right. Yeah, because, yeah. Well, what it suggests is it, it suggests a, a serious approach to music, a very solid approach. That's good. Mm. You know, it, it suggests substance. You know, mm. that's that's good. That's what we try to promote. Mm-hmm. In the states, it's not necessarily that way. Yeah, in the states, a little more. You're a little more uh, on dodgy ground, and people do get into the nostalgia. Yeah. Trip. Well, that's good to hear. That. Yeah. yeah. The instruments you're using this time around are these the same as the one you, ones you've been using before? Pretty much. No major changes. I was watching them. What did you say? <laughs> we're using the same hardware, the same instruments this time around that uh, you used last time. Uh, as far as he and I are concerned, for sure, and. Uh, if I was to have to think of the whole band, I'd guess yes. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Alan changes uh, uh, bases a lot, you know. He, he had, he, Alan has a lot of bases, and he gets his favorite ones from one period of time to another. Yes. Uh, well, I don't want to keep on bass. You guys are credited with using a lot of different guitars on the record, though. Different sounds, you know. Uh, recording a lot of times, you use a different guitar for a different sound. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I use the Paul Reed Smith guitars a lot and uh, my Stratocaster quite a bit. And then, of course, the Les Paul, uh, I use a, a whole lot in this in this band. And, uh, uh, we really don't use that many guitars I think, on the recording. I think in the studio, you know, you, it's nothing like on stage because on stage you don't really have time or, or, or the inclination even to change and change and change. In the studio you have all this time to think about the best approach to a, a tune and, and uh, how the guitar is taping f- 
before in relation to the other instrument. It's told absolutely different. So you can go back and play in live. So we do use a lot of guitar. I used uh, I used two different electric guitars myself, and um, and then a lot of those things were were the acoustics. For right. come in my kitchen, we used. We wanted we wanted to point out that the dobro was used and the national steel because I think guitar players that would be a point of interest. You know, it's it's really aside from just acoustic guitar. It, the national steel body is a certain thing, dobro is a certain thing, and then the Martin and what have you is a whole other. Yeah, like on uh, let's see, end of the line, uh, we basically cut the track live as it went down and I, Dickie played his Les Paul and I played my Stratocaster and I went back and uh, played a Martin Acoustic as an overdub where live you don't have that luxury of adding to what's already there yeah. you know we thought well a, a nice acoustic would help this song out you know and so th those kind of things you know require a few more guitars live you got to go with the most versatile the most dependable the sound that you can control you know mm -hmm. Okay, we got. I think just time for maybe a question or two. But you want us to ask you what the, the title of the record means? Two worlds. Shade, shades of two worlds. I, uh, I kind of spawned that idea, I think, and then Warren and I worked on it, different variations of it, you know, till it, till it kind of came into being. But uh, with the music. Uh, my feeling of it is with the music and the title and the cover shot front and back we were trying to kind of convey the thought of from the Robert Johnson 1930 Dirt Road Delta Blues acoustic guitar thing through the rhythm and blues influences that we have then we went through the Charlie Parker homage that we paid on Kind of Bird which was in the 40s and 50s and in the jazz era. And uh, Nobody Knows is really an abstract, artistic kind of, or not a, a, an abstract, poetic kind of uh, thing, you know. Uh, so we felt like we covered a big spectrum, you know, like from Dirt Road uh, Delta Blues from 1930 to really avant-garde uh, modern rock mm -hmm. so just shades of two worlds you know and then the cover is uh, the old house you know and the kind of the ghetto on the front which, which to us kind of denotes like the hard times you know and working man's kind of thing in the back is the mushroom kind of uh, drifting dream dream music kind of. it, you know it's really hard to explain I'm kind of stammering a lot but it, it's uh -huh. it's uh, kind of an intangible thing but there's a concept that, that's the general concept uh -huh. yeah, the the whole um, approach to the Allman Brothers music has always kind of been combining elements that uh, were not com had never been combined that way before mm. you know mm. and there are definitely two worlds uh, colliding at times on this record mm. 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 Um, well, as we've run out of time here, one last thing we'd like you to do is uh, give a little piece of advice for our you know, aspiring uh, guitar playing readers. I say play what you feel and don't be scared to go after something that you don't, that you're not aware of, you know. Always try and stretch out for something new. Uh, and I think uh, young musicians need to place a lot of emphasis on improvisation, which for a long time didn't seem to be happening. I think uh, uh, jamming is the most musical satisfaction you'll ever get out of playing music. Playing parts and uh, rehearsing your brains out is not what it's all about. <laughs> you know, really playing music, I mean, for people like us where you approach it like... Uh, from a blues angle or from a jazz angle, it's all about about improv and learn how to do that and do it as often and as well as possible. How, how does one become good at improvising? Just just by doing it? Yeah, just do it. Yeah, like when I was a kid and uh, the first bands we ever had, they weren't any good. None of us could play, but we were jamming. We were trying to do something 
you know, that we couldn't do, but we were trying to do it. And, uh, and it seemed like for a long time and years to come that people just quit doing that. Nobody was jamming anymore. And there's not a whole lot of bands jamming on stage anymore. Us, The Grateful Dead, Santana, Little Feet, you know, uh, bands like that that are that are jamming, but uh, that's got to come back into rock music in order for rock music to stay interesting, in my opinion. I th I'm real, very adamant about uh, when I get a chance to give uh, young people some advice about their guitar playing or drumming or <laughs> piano or anything else, but we're talking guitars, but... Uh, from knowing a lot of young guitar players and, and giving some tips here and there to, to guitar players along the way, it comes from kind of personal experience too, but young, young guys tend to listen to their favorites, you know, their stars. And uh, they watch them on MTV and they get their records and they tend to have their favorite stars and they copy them. And uh, it is imperative that they go way beyond that you know that they have to learn not only who their stars that they look up to and watch and and study where they learn to play and not only that where those people learn to play and it goes all the way back down the lineage and it, it, there's an actual lineage that it follows down through the years back to, and it always ends up back at Robert Johnson. And it can even go past Robert Johnson, but I think uh, Robert Johnson is more responsible for expressing the human condition more than the people that preceded him, like Sunhouse. Sunhouse is considered in that same uh, category too, though. He just wasn't the... Uh, great guitarist that, that, that Robert Johnson was. He was a great singer and orator. But you've got to have that Robert Johnson up through the jazz era, and then you get into your favorites. If your favorite is the blues, then study the B.B. Kings and the Albert Kings and the Freddie Kings and the Eric Clapton's and right on up through the, from Eric Clapton to Led Zeppelin, from Led Zeppelin to the heavy metal. Uh, into whatever whoever you're listening to you know but it comes right up like that mm -hmm. if you don't do that you, your playing is always going to be shallow and, and as far as improv goes like Boren was saying working out complicated band movements is, is only half the, the thing uh, you have to learn to Im improvise and the other important thing I, I would stress to young players is get out of your practice hall and and or, or Maybe you can't get out of the practice hall when you're not old enough to play clubs, but get friends into your practice place to jam with. Don't just play by yourself or just one other friend. Get people in. I mean, even if you don't know how to start a band, pretend you're starting a band. and Get, get, you know, get a number of people over and change and play and relate to this person and this and keep changing. You know, And, uh, of course, when you get older and you can go to clubs and play clubs when they have jam sessions. Go to every jam session. But that's it. The lineage, go go back to the lineage. I mean, I was talking to a guitar player the other day that he didn't know who Eric Clapton was. Now, I know that's unusual, but this kid was a pretty good guitar player. He didn't know who Eric Clapton was. You know? And I said, geez, you know. <laughs> If you don't know who Eric Clapton is, you don't know who nobody. I mean, it, it, you don't even go that far back. But that's very, very important. That and jam with other people. Hmm. Some photos here, and send you on your merry way. Hey, uh, Jack Bruce. And uh, they were auditioning him. They hired him. While they were auditioning. They said, "You know, born under a bad sun." And he said, "Yeah." Robin Ford. He said, oh, you, he said, I want you to learn the cream version. He goes, well, I never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> or the album. <laughs> yeah, Damn, yeah, that that album. Guys, can, can you get your uh, signature on the... Yes. Two, two or just uh, one? <laughs> he also played with Charlie Musselwhite. That's right, yeah, that's right. 
Tom was coming off of that. Three I was telling was this this guitar player auditioning for Jack Bruce. Uh -huh. And Jack said, well, let's play Born Under the Bad Sun. So this guy starts playing Robin Ford's version of it. He'd never heard <laughs> uh, Dream Scream. Yeah, 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 really. Let's let's have a king. Yeah, version, yeah. You know? and, he, and Jack said, you're playing that wrong. He goes, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll show you the CD, man. <laughs> You know, the amazing thing about him, though, is he can change his tone mm -hmm. without changing his box, his guitar, or anything. Just the way he plays, sure. just the way he holds the instrument. Yeah, yeah. Light touch to a real... Oh, yeah, yeah. He broke his string, he broke his top E, and that's when he really went to town. <laughs> the pressure is high, and he, 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 he rose to the moment. Okay, why don't you each hold a guitar, and why don't you just sit on the stand, and why don't you just sit by the window? Uh, it has Spurzel tuners that lock from the bottom, and it has uh, one of those nuts that it goes, it's like a roller system. Uh -huh. you know, it has a, a little pin, the strings roll across it, uh -huh. like that. Uh, Hello there. Hi, Warren. How you doing? <laughs> How you doing? Oh, crazy. Yeah? So nothing's changed? You can tell me. How you doing? Steve Harris. Hi, Steve. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. This is Steve, the Magger, young guitarist. All right. It's a gun type. <laughs> yeah, I remember you guys from last year. Yeah, just one year ago. It's almost a time of the day. Yeah. Here, I guess we talked to you guys the day before the show, and you saw the show the following day. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was quite impressed. Uh, it was a great, great show. Well, thank you. Uh, that guitar is an American Standard Stratocaster uh, with a special color made in the custom shop from Fender and it has the Eric Clapton electronics in it. They don't make that guitar with the, with that color or with that electronic, so the custom shop made it for me. Uh, and it's a, a new guitar, but it's, it happens to be a, a very nice new guitar. And it's one that I play a whole lot, record a whole lot with. Uh, I think the Eric Clapton electronics with the mid-range control really makes a big difference in, for me to be able to play it on stage and sometimes have it sound like a Stratocaster and then other times have it sound more like a Gibson or, you know, a fatter humbucker kind of sound. Lace sensor. Lace sensor, yes. Nuts and pegs are... Can, uh, yeah, they're the the standard, I think they call them. Mm -hmm. Just the, the, they're a copy of the Les Paul pickup. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't change because I wanted to change from the old Gibson pickups to that. I changed because the old Gibson pickups went bad. Mm -hmm. In what way? They were just so old. Uh -huh. They were 30 years old, and they, they quit working. They got One quit working altogether. The other one got real weak. So, um, uh, you know, I just tr thought, I, I well, I had to change. I, it happened on the road, the one went out. So I had to do something quick, and I happened to be in New York, so I just went to Seymour Duncan and asked him, and they have, uh, I'd like to try their standard Les Paul pickup. You know, it's a copy of the Les Paul. Mm -hmm. And um, I tried them, and it was so good. I just ne didn't bother to change them. They sound, they sound really good. Hmm. I, I think it's the uh, this is back to the tone too. Now that you're bringing this up again, but I think really you uh, played about two and a half hours, but he heard you guys had even wanted to play longer than that. Yeah, a lot of times we're faced with a curfew situation yeah. where we have to stop at a certain time, and we'd like to keep going. Sometimes, uh, you know, when, when we're allowed to, we'll play three, three and a half hours. Right. I think one of the things here is uh, we've been told, anyway, that the train systems stop at a certain time. If we don't quit playing, then everybody's stranded, you know, without a ride, and, and so that's what we're doing. Yeah, then, so, I'm not gonna, so people, uh, you know, he saw it, they were so impressed that uh, when they f finishing the show, they were uh, completely fatigued. Because they got into so much. Yeah. Us too. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mutual thing. So, then, some time, three shows, I got done. 
There were three things that particularly stood out in the show. The first was uh, your, your tone that you was, was uh, quite amazing. Uh, the second thing was your slide guitar. Or you said that you know rivaled anything you heard Dwayne Allman ever do. And the third thing was just the the, the, the power of the unit as a whole. The three things really stood out uh, when you saw the show. Mm, comment? I mean, I don't know what to comment. Yeah, well, but domo. <laughs> 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 That's the, the thing is, you know, for the unit to work well together is the most important thing, I think, for all of us, you know. It, uh, most of the time, we're able to do that, you know. I mean, it's it's hard to get up there night after night and, and put that much into it, you know. It's not like we're just up there uh, playing the licks off the record, you know. We're up there trying to give 110% every night, and, you know, so that's the, uh, if, if we pull that off, definitely we hope people notice it. So, in that case, you know, 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 you